All right, in, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about thematic mapping and what that really means in terms of when we go to create a map, what, do, what are some of the things we have to look out for as we go through? So, first of all, we need to talk about map organization. We want a nice balanced map. So this is kind of the cartography side of things. And we want something that's nice and balanced. And, um, and then we need some very particular things on the map. So there's a few things missing here, which, um, which I'm going to point out. But the first thing we need is a title. You definitely need a title all the time. With the title should always come your name and the date that you published the map. Because then it, everyone knows when that map was created. So at least um, they, if they refer to it, they're like, oh, that's the year it was made. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we have a legend, which is important as well. Um, and so that tells us what we're seeing on the map, the different things on the map. When, what's key with the legend is that you never want a title that says legend. Because what happens with that is I know it's a legend. Like anybody who looks at a map knows, oh, if I look there, then it will tell me what this is on the map. So what you need to do is tell, be a little bit more descriptive and explain what it is. So for example, here it's like park, forest, lakes, and states. This would be referring to the natural areas of the U.S. or something. Like There's not very many there, so a title isn't necessarily super important. So. Either leave off the title if you can't find a good descriptive title for a legend or give it a good descriptive title. Don't use the word legend. <clears throat> sorry. So, and the legend of the title is different from the legend, or sorry, the title of the actual map. And then there's the scale. So there's two types of scales that we want to include. The first one is a scale bar, but we also want to include the scale ratio. Because if any, anybody wants to measure something on the map, especially on a UTM map or a 3TM map, then you're going to, you want to allow them to be able to calculate with that value. This particular scale bar will not allow them to do any calculations, it just gives a general reference. Now with that, I just mentioned, oh, if you're using UTM or 3TM. So that also needs to be part of the map organization. So you should always have what map projection that you need, that you are using, because then we can identify what distortions that are going to be appearing on that map. So that is so far, we've got title, we've got legend, we've got two different scale bars and the map projection. Next thing is a north arrow. So sometimes the north arrow is um, not important because it depends on what type of map projection you are using. If, the, if you're using a UTM, the north is always straight up on the page, so therefore a north arrow makes sense. But if you're using a conformal conic, then your north is different to everywhere you look. So putting a north arrow is not necessarily that important. Then there is the neat line that goes around the map. And it kind of identifies and makes it very clear as to where that map is. This area in here with the data is called the data pane. Um, another thing that's also missing on here is the source of the data. So where did they get the data from? You don't want to be caught in a situation where you have a um, somebody's going, hey, that's my data, and you're making money off of it, and then they come after you and sue you for it. So you always want to make sure that you have the source of the data on the map. And then here we identify the media edge, which would be the edge of the paper or maybe the computer screen or et cetera. So there should be 10 items there. So let's go title, your name, the date that you published the map, the legend, the scale bar, the scale ratio, the map projection, the north arrow, the neat line, and last but not least, and probably one of the most important is the source citation. So those are the 10 things that you should see on a map display like this. So here's um, an example with some of it. So here they've got their source citation. Again, like I said, it's really important. So you can see how they placed it in the center. There's a, this is called an inset. So it's like a little mini map on the side. And you can see here, again, year of last fire. That is, a, that is a title to the legend. It's a lot more descriptive than just saying legend because then I don't know what these numbers mean. So it, we, this is one example. This is another example. 
So here's all the things around there that we need. So title, legend, scale, source credits, north arrow. You can label things in there. This is an inset, right? Alaska and Hawaii are put into insets because they don't actually belong there, but they can be represented in a, a small area. There is a background, which we refer to as ground. The figure is the map itself. And then a neat line up top. So that's just a few more pieces that you can see that show up on maps, and you'll likely see that. So as I was taking those as an example, we need to ask, what is thematic mapping? So it is the mapping that emphasizes the spatial distribution of one or more geographic attributes or variables. And not necessarily does it have to be like geographic. It can be any kind of attribute and variable. So looking at a a map of a amusement park. The rides are not necessarily geographic, but it is some sort of attribute. You're like, oh, that's where I find that roller coaster, and that's where I find that roller coaster. So it has a one or more like themes to it is what it, what it comes down to. And then what is spatial data? Well, spatial data is the information about the location, shape, and relationships among geographic features or objects. So this is really, yeah, like where is it located and how is it related in space um, to something else around it? So when you go to create a thematic map, here are the main um, steps that you would follow. So first of all, you need to consider how is it actually distributed across the world in, in that particular location. Um, and then you can think, what is the actual purpose of that map? So what am I really aiming for? And then I'm going to go and collect the data that I need for that map. And I'm going to make the map. And then I'm going to ask users before I publish it. Can you read this? Does it make sense? What do you think of this color? What do you think of that symbol? Do you understand what it's showing? So once you, with that, now we need to think about moving more into detail about what is spatial data. So we have spatial dimensions here. So we have three different kinds of phenomena that happen in the, on, on, on the Earth's surface. The first one is a point phenomena. And this means it has zero spatial extent. There's zero dimensions. It's just a single point on the map and that's it. Um, then there's linear phenomenon, which has one dimensional spatial extent. So it has length, but no width. And then there's the aerial phenomenon, which is two-dimensional and spatial extent and has both length and width. So you can think point, lines, and areas. Now there are three types of maps I'm going to cover here. So the first one is a point or symbol map, and the next one is a choropleth map, and then the third is an isopleth map. So the point symbol maps um, are the spatial distributions represented as discrete surfaces. So here we can, we can see in the back here that we're looking at the number of households purchasing bottled water. So in this case, we can see Quebec purchases a lot and PEI purchases probably the least. And then on this one, we've got this, so this is an area map. And then we've, this one looks at average daily minimum temperature. And what they've done is they've taken a, a space and they've moved it closer together and into a single point at one location. So, um, so this is taking continuous data that covers an entire area because you only don't you don't have temperature only in one spot. You have temperature everywhere, but taking it and then trying to represent it in terms of points. And then here's lines. So we can see in this case um, linear features. I, it, I believe it has to do with a pipeline. That image looks like it's for a pipeline. So looking at different changes in density or changes in pressure in that region. So that's the lines and then of course point symbols across it. Now there's proportional symbol mapping as well, which when we use proportional symbol mapping, this is the best example and, and so is this one. So what it means is that the proportion of that data is going to vary um, based on how many, what that number is. So I might have a, the largest one, and there's actually a mathematical scaling calculation that you can use to make them the correct size.
So I'm going to say like 100% here versus 50%. So 50% should be half of the 100%. 40% should be 10% less. And then and count down. So you can see how that nice progression happens here. And this one, it, this circle is about half of this one. And then this one is about a tenth of this one. And that's proportional symbol mapping. So showing those symbols changing proportionally based on the value that we are seeing. The next one is a choropleth map. And this is when we shade observed units with an intensity proportional to the data values. So that means that we're going to color our polygons with different colors. And again, there's a, we try to keep things related, right? So you can see that there's a, a, a progression of the color, starting with white in this case, or a light gray, up to a dark red, and it progresses through. Again, you can assess the, um, the change in color with respect to the number, but it doesn't have to be the same scale. So you can see 1 to 13, 22 to 242. So just showing that the highest number is the big red and the lowest number is, is white. So we're looking in 2003, this is an old map, but if we're looking like, for example, at robberies, we can see these four states have, very, have only 22, or and then these ones here, where the 242 are these states here for robberies. The last is an isopleth map. So this is where we're really looking at continuous data. So what we're, we're doing is connecting points that have the same theme, so such as like temperature, average wind speed, for example. Um, and, and this one is different gases that are, that are out there, I believe. Progression, oh, calls for service. So these are different calls. Um, this one is, it's cut, it's cut off, so we don't know what that one is. <laughs> and then this is our soil carbon dioxide concentrations. So this one's hydrogen ion concentration. So these are hydrogen ion concentrations, and this is our soil carbon dioxide concentration. So it doesn't just like stop at an edge, right? So there's this like progress all the way through. And so these ones are really good for showing this like slow progression over a change in, by using changing colors. So you can use all different kinds of colors, but the bars just show this progress between a higher concentration or a higher number to a lower number. So that brings us into like, how do we actually measure geographic variables? So there's qual qualitative and quantitative. And um, the, the qualitative data is nominal. So it, it means that it, it kind of classifies the data and it gives it a name. And so there's no real value, like numerical value that's associated with it. Then there's quantitative. So we can put quantitative into three different categories. And there's, so there's ordinal, which means that there might, it may not be actual values, but we can actually, we can say that something is worth more than another. So you think types of highways. So if we have a highway, that, and we have a primary highway and a secondary highway, maybe we have a four lane or six lane highway versus a four lane highway versus a two lane highway, we can put those into an ordinal rank. And we can say, okay, well, this is a primary, this is a secondary, even though there's kind of that word that's associated with it. But we can also look at rivers, right? So we can say, you know, do we have a river or a creek or a stream? The interval is where we do have ordinal values, so we actually have two values that mean something. So we, we, these can be arbitrary or they can actually mean something. So it could mean, it could be something like number of people in the household, and we're looking at categories perhaps of like large numbers to small numbers. And last but not least is a ratio. And this is where we're actually looking at values that have a number, so like temperature or population density. So that and then and an object that has none of it gets zero in that case. So this is kind of the difference between things and it's like arbitrary. This one's more absolute. So mm, data. So we've got some data there that we're going to try to represent. 
and we can classify it so we can put them all together and how they how they represent each other so that would be nominal data and then we have ordinal data which we can put them into the ones I like the least and the ones I like the most and then we can put it into interval data as well so I like the coffee crisp the least but and much less than the smarties so it's much less but I like Kit Kat a lot and Arrow a little bit more. So I'm going to put those ones kind of together. So that would be interval. And last but not least is ratio data. And it's like, you owe me an arrow. There's no arrow. I have one arrow or I have twice as many arrows. So that would be ratio. So now I've got numbers associated with it. So moving on from there, we have four different kinds of maps here that we can um, that we can display and create. So the first one is a univariate map, then we have a bivariate map, then we have multivariate maps, and then we have dot density. So a univariate map is exactly what it sounds like. Um, then it, it has one variable that we are looking at. And then we have a bivariate map, and that one is means it's got two variables. Then we have our multivariate map, which is a multiple variable map, so it shows many things. Then we have dot density maps, which is a totally different thing altogether. <laughs> so we'll get to that. So univariate, one theme, that's all it's showing. So unemployment rate across the board, where is it higher, where is it lower? And then we have two themes. So now you can see that there's two symbols being involved. The first one is showing lines and, and kind of hatchings. The second one is showing numbers. And so this gives me two pieces of information at the same time. And now I can make some sort of relationship between the two. Another example of a bivariate map is looking at, for example, land area versus the number of orchards. So we can find certain regions with with more um, with more orchards and see if there's any relationship between perhaps the total land area versus the the amount of orchards. Multivariate maps means you're looking at lots of things. So here we in this example that's showing sand, cobble, ledge, and no data. And so it's trying to identify like a geological map, trying to show different types of land and, and, and ground data. So these ones are a lot more complicated because you can put like, and you can actually see elevation data in here as well. So there's elevation data, there's, um, there's multiple themes that are happening here. So when I look at this, I see two different themes, but at the same time, they're a little bit different, right? So we've got different kinds of, of, of soil properties here. Okay, then we have dot density maps, which is the last one. So now every dot equals a certain number of people. So in this case, or in farms in this case. So what they, they've done in this case is that it, they count 300 farms and they put a dot there, like in the center. And then they count another 300 farms and they put another dot and then another dot, another dot. So what that does is it creates kind of like a continuous flow of the entire area to see where the number of farms are. So we can see very high density of farms here and a little bit sparser out here. Now in saying, saying that, the, um, the dot densities are very useful for that. So, and that's a, like a univariate map, but uses dots instead. So sometimes maps are not what they seem. So let's look at this one. So we have number of people employed in farming, fishing, and forestry, and then percent for farming, I guess, low and high is 7% or 1%, like is this in, I think it's percent. So we're kind of guessing. And so now I go here to there. What is this really telling me? So there's a, this one doesn't really tell me enough information for me to really start making a relationship other than like, well, it's high and versus low. 
but does that mean it's unemployment rate or or is it is it because that that is the like these low areas is that just because there is no farming or fishing or forestry so there's a lot of questions still left here's another one um so you know the how much you spend and they spent on public education in those years so we looking at it again these these colors can you tell me which one is this one by looking at the map it makes it really hard to read because all the colors are so close together so we don't really want to have them blend together like that especially if we're trying to identify different themes and then there's this one where we have a change in manufacturing employment so again where does this fail well looking at you know really tiny differences between this one and this one right so how do we see the difference between those when, when looking out here? We might be able to guess, but it doesn't really work that well. And is this like these numbers, does that mean the number of people or is it a percentage or what, right? So again, not providing enough information. There's also, uh, the, what the biggest thing with those is this eye limitation. So we can really only see seven to eight shades of one color at the most. So to be, and that is just to be able to bring it back and forth between them. So between these two, if I look at the map and I come back, I'm not sure which one that is. Same with these, you know, and then this, well, those ones seem a little bit more close, but these ones, for example, my brain cannot comprehend that. So this is really what I am seeing, but this is what I've been given. So now it causes a bias for me. Another thing is the number of intervals. So if I have four or more, there are four intervals or more, there's less results in overgeneralization. So for example, here I have four. Um, and so does it really separate the data very well? Because I've got like 29 here, got 25 here, but then I would in these other regions, I've got 24.7 versus 24.3. Like, does it really classify it very well? And probably not, because even though there's only a few numbers in between, as it's showing, and we've got larger ranges and smaller ranges, and that's okay, you can do that. This is, this is another type of data set. But if we have too few, then we have a hard time seeing it. But if we have, or we have, over generalization. If we have four or more, at least we can get some more information and provide more detail to who is reading it. But you don't want to exceed the same number of colors over and over and over again. So another thing is, is what if you have a dark color on a dark color, for example? That doesn't make it easy to read. So what's really difficult to, to distinguish, these are okay, but we've got yellow Yellow is really hard. It says avoid yellow to green colors on a map, unless you're just showing green for the sake of, of showing like kind of a bright color for vegetation or something. Then if we put dark red symbols or magenta symbols or thin lines on black or dark blue, you're never going to see it. <laughs> so watch for that contrast between that. Same with dark red characters. Um, the, you really can't see dark red characters in black text when you're reading a map and they don't they don't stand out like what we're what we really want so it or it's all that you see and the black just kind of disappears so blue backgrounds dark blue backgrounds are really hard to work with or black dark blue area symbols is another one other things to avoid is red pure red um, use something that's a little bit less pure red because it's not so bright, a little bit easier to look at. Um, and then change to orange, which is more like that. And then same with green, avoid pure green because it's super bright and really, and it confuses with red or brown if you happen to be colorblind, okay? So this is a really bright color, so try not that. So use more of a bluish green and now, depending on the type of color blindness with this background, you might not be able to see that, but be very careful. So always ask around to see what people think about the colors you're using. 
pastel -y colors are better. Lighter colors that kind of mix with other colors is also better. Patterns is another one that can be really hard to interpret. Um, so dots and lines, markers, there's, they, can, they can be easy to interpret, but they can be hard. Sometimes they can get really hard on the eyes. Like if you had a whole map with lines like this, it, it would be a lot. So just be cautious that you're not overdoing it with lines. It's a quick way to get a headache. <laughs> you can also use different shapes, but then again, if you can imagine, you know, the, the old the old wallpaper and then you try to throw like another type of wallpaper beside it and then another type of wallpaper. You have like five different kinds of wallpaper on your wall. It really looks busy and it doesn't look nice. So you can use them, but only use them in certain spots. So that is the end of the thematic mapping um, lecture. And so we will be getting more into other concepts in the following weeks. So thank you for your attention and I will see you in class.